I was a huge fan of Love, Death, and Robots. To get asked to do the first sequel in the bunch of uh, Love, Death, and Robots was neat. If you look at this, you go, how is it done? It's like a million techniques merging into one. This is entirely 2D, I would guess. There's no evidence in here of it being 3D. So we're looking at a piece here that's 3D, it's CG, but it's shaded to look like it's a cartoon. Cartoon shading. Can you define what that is technically for us? This video is brought to you by Honkai Impact. Stick around to the end to see how you can get some cool stuff for free. Hey, welcome back to another episode of Animators React. We have a very special guest today by the fact that there's actually two guests. We have Alex Snow and Patrick Osborne. Incredible artists, animators, directors even. You know what, I'm gonna let these guys do the introductions. I'm Alex Snow, I'm an animator, currently working on Strange World at Disney. I also am a founder at Double Plus Productions, doing mainly 2D animation for commercial work, series, film. Wait, Patrick, who are you? I'm Patrick Osborne, I am an animator and a director. I animated at places like Sony Imageworks for a long time and Disney, and have recently been doing stuff out on my own. They Blur, for example, on Love, Death, and Robots. Oh, cool. Love, Death, and Robots is requested so many times on the show, and we finally have somebody who worked on an episode here. So now we can actually talk about it in depth. Love, Death, and Robots is pretty unique, I think. Like, Tim Miller, he's a really awesome animator and director himself. He'll go after an idea for years. Like, Love, Death, and Robots is 12 or 13 years of trying to get this kind of thing made. His general approach is like, this story works really cool on the page. What if I paired it with this director and see what they do? And what's really neat is it's a mix of the directors come from all kind of different creative backgrounds. I'm an animator, some of them are VFX soups, some are like story artists. Let's start with yours. Sure, I mean, I was a huge fan of Love, Death, and Robots. To get asked to do the first sequel in the bunch of uh, Love, Death, and Robots was, was neat. Welcome to the unsinkable libertarian dream that is seasteading. This is made by a small studio in Spain called Blow Studio. Now I like to be a little bit hands-on and know the software they use. They use 3ds Max. 3ds Max. Wow. I Whoa. know nothing about 3ds Max, <laughs> so this was a really technically hands-off for me. This is one of the favorites. It's why they would make a sequel, so you don't want to ruin it. You know, you don't want to do anything too silly that feels out of the style, but also you got to build on it somehow. It's a little bit tricky. Like, what is a fresh look on the post-apocalypse? I really did like the idea of doing like an oil rig paradise seastead thing. Yeah. I felt like that I hadn't really seen in any video game or anything. Yeah. Like that. When you're going into direct a short animated film. Do you need to get as close to nailing that short down before you actually animate it, right? Yeah. So how do you do that? You just storyboard it a lot. So you basically just make a janky animated version of it first? Yeah, you hand draw storyboards with hopefully a team, try to cut together a visual plan for the whole movie. And that way everyone knows what set needs to be built, what needs to be drawn, what can be a matte painting. It's all kind of like bid out from that storyboard. You kind of plan it from the script too, budgetarily, but the storyboard focuses it a lot more. Like so much of directing is like selling and yeah. pitching and working on story and getting artwork together and that's all scrappy and there's something really nice about just making a movie that is usually just the very end. So the idea yeah. of like making the shots and making the performance work and cutting it together is so satisfying that it's a dream to do this kind of stuff. So if these tech millionaires had been just a little more socially inclusive... Do each of the characters have kind of like a set of rules or what they're allowed to move like? And I mean, obviously definitely. these three move very differently, both because of their proportions, but also their One's character. One's a pyramid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and one is a pyramid drone. They do have kind of... They have character rules. Like the little guy is based on a baby monitor is designed, so it's like he's a lot more hopeful. The pyramid is kind of the smartest and the most kind of like factual and down to earth. And the X-Bot, the humanoid one, kind of sees himself as like human-like. And they move similarly to that. I mean, there's a jumpy bounciness to the orange guy, the KVRC, and the and X-Bot's very humanoid. What was your rule for like where the eyeball should be for which emotion on Pyramid Guy? You literally just have a Y axis. And there's not a lot there. That character doesn't emote much. So, I, <laughs> you know, I never I never was like that character needs to feel happy. I mean, it's a bad answer, but like Well, it's interesting it's not a cool too cuz like if you think of Baymax, who you think of as like lots of character, his face doesn't change. Yeah. It's just eyes. And x -Bot just has a jaw that opens yeah, up and down. True. Yeah, I mean, they're pretty limited when you really look at what's moving, but it doesn't feel that way. You guys, I think one of these rockets actually launched. Come check this out. My goal with this whole thing is like, I'm an emotional filmmaker. Like the stuff that I like to do, like I like trying to pull a little bit of something. So I do like that at the end of this short, there's a little hint of like these robots being like, do I feel something? 
something. <laughs> is there something in the, the kind of ambition of humans to leave and like all of that? Right. I wonder if Elon Musk has seen this. <laughs> he made what it. What do you think? He's a real director. Yeah. You look at this, you go, how is it done? It's like a million techniques merging into one. It's hard to describe a specific thing. So Robert Valley, awesome illustrator, he animates in Photoshop mostly, which is unbelievable. And he's got like tutorials out there so you guys can go see how it's literally done. It's mostly just amazing talent and time. I mean, he's just doing so much to get this to work the way it does, and it works like nothing else you've seen. It's warping things, it's doing puppetry on things, it's keeping things simplistic, like that guy yelling is just a silhouette puppet. The use of gradients in all the drawings just really changes it from being yeah. like hand-drawn stuff you see everywhere else. Oh, it's yeah. So it's definitely like one of those extremely well-planned, the case when you're doing an illustrative style like this, where everything's very intentional, and any frame looks like an amazing illustration comic book page. So. Yeah. I mean, if you watch his older stuff, like Parasiter and Cigarettes, it's very much this, but animated like cheap After Effects, just kind of moving parts and puppetry. But this takes it to another level, like the traditional animation details of how the characters are moving and then still being able to do the render work. He's kind of evolved it to the next stage. Okay, stop. Whales don't like the machines. I love that he's, every image feels so unified in what Robert Valley does. Like, that is the compositing. It's like the layers of a little bit of grain, little chromatic aberration on the edges of things that kind of like squish it all into a finished image. I think one thing that's kind of overlooked is that the creator, the director, really knows how the stuff is made. Yeah. And like all of his choices and planning along the way of getting to the end know what's hard to redo and what takes the time and what yeah. doesn't. There's something special about being able to do it because he actually like knows how to do it. When you talk about like stylistic 3D versus hand-drawn 2D, 3D tends to be more forgiving on the directability side in a lot of ways. Yeah. Like you can change your mind later. Right. Uh, this stuff is really hard to change your mind uh, <laughs> down the road. You yeah. know, like you have to redraw a lot if you realize the shot doesn't work. And uh, that's why I say like the director doing this, it's great that he kind of invented the technique and made it his own because as a director, you don't want to make a call that is like very expensive call and accident. Yeah. yeah. About time we head back to the lander. Oh, come on, Burton. This one is, uh, it's 3D, but there's hand-drawn elements on top of it. Directed by Emily Dean. This is, I believe, her directorial debut. The idea of kind of taking on a look that is challenging and so beloved by the animation world is, is really cool and bold. Mobius is a, an illustrator that is referenced a ton in all kinds of stuff. Fifth Element, like yeah. Valerian is a Mobius story. Really beautiful stuff and it's been inspiring filmmakers. And I think this short ended up looking really beautiful. So we're looking at a piece here that's 3D, it's CG, but it's shaded to look like it's a cartoon. Cartoon shading. Can you define what that is technically for us? Yeah, a lot of 3D animation is very photoreal, so it's looking at all of bounce light and following the curvature of a 3D object and giving realistic shading. And there are different ways to render where you can actually make it, where that shading is not as real, where it's divided into a dark side and a light side. It's not like a feathered fall off. It's hard line. Yeah, and it gives you a much more uh, comic book or cartoon or handmade look in some ways because, I mean, that really comes from the, the process of making comics was labor intensive and it would take a longer time to draw something real. So you would find these shorthands in how to draw it. It's weird that it's kind of harder to do in 3D because everything has pushed towards making things look very realistic and dimensional. Wake up. Wake up. Tell me how you technically achieve this look. How do I do this? Okay, I sit down on the computer, I can fire a blender. Yeah. I want to make it look like this. You know, most programs, most renders have various tune shades. There's all kinds of little plugins you can get. Blender specifically, you know, it has that freestyle line render is in there. So I think you're building your full body character rig first, like about here, like this distance and kind of figuring out what your like line settings need to be. And it's probably a combination of a little bit of texture painted lines that you choose to show occasionally. But that exterior line is all created by a line render, like Freestyle in Blender. And you can make blends and stuff, like you create the shape, 
or the texture or the whatever, and then you can dial in how much it's on or off. But you could also have different levels where if you change the, let's say, cheek line, they're creeping in from the ear towards the mouth or the amount of lines, even like the crease between her nostril and her mouth. You know, that's not always there. It creeps in to give it feel more panicked. It's same thing in Spider-Verse, like whether you see that line or how thick it is. You can also do a curve on the character so you can actually scale it and stretch it and it's actually like a rigged line. If I was doing it, like uh, those close-ups would be a custom rig, but then you could actually even draw on top of it and, yeah. and add a little extra. So you do like a few lines that are the, the ones you know you're gonna have no matter what, and then on top of it, uh, draw in a layer of detail and for when creases happen and stuff yeah. like that. I mean, obviously they're making specific choices with what tracks with the head and the movement, whereas something like Spider-Verse, maybe that decision isn't definite but this seems like it's leaning into its choices a little more. How would you achieve something like this efficiently and you know, take that art form you're finding and attempt to match it? Yeah, I mean, it starts with the artwork. You, know, you do a few frames of what you're trying to do visually in yeah. single still frames. A lot of times the conversation, this kind of stuff is like, at this distance, what do we draw? At this distance, what do we draw? Because right. the faces generally need to be more detailed as you get close to camera. Right. I mean, you'll see some close-ups here that look clearly might even be hand animated. And the 3D shows itself, but I think it does it in an appealing way. This is Kill Team Kill. This is directed by Jen Nelson. And Jen is also the supervising director of the entire second and third season, which means that as a director working on the show, she's the one that you actually interact with more than uh, anyone else. She's you know, looking at boards and giving notes in there at all my recording sessions uh, with the actors and stuff too. So huge impact on the series is coming from her. Let's shoot it. Fire, fire! This is entirely 2D, I would guess. I, yeah. There's no evidence in here of it being 3D. I imagine it's digital, it's drawn on tablets, but all by hand. So there's a lot of like cool camera stuff, but that's all compositing tricks, like dropping things out of focus, doing some shake a little grain, a little aberration in the lighting here and there. And when we talk about the Toon Shade stuff, the computer's kind of deciding where the dark and light mask is based on placing a virtual light. When you're doing it by hand, it's someone like physically drawing a mask. Basically draw a black and white image that is just masking out where the light hits on the characters. And then you can fill that with a solid color, a gradient, like a blend from a dark to a light to add a little bit more texture and dimension to it. Does it also let you easily just change light colors if you mm -hmm. want to after the fact? Yeah, easily do that flicker that you can see in there that they're doing. You know, you want that mask to be able to do stuff like that. You're doing hand work, but you're also kind of using modern tools. Yeah, and then on top of that, you can also composite like you do in CG or, you know, real live action film using After Effects. Compositors do a lot of hard work, but they also are there at the moment when, <laughs> like, it looks great yeah. and get a lot of applause. Right. There's, like, <laughs> like, there's more applause and, like, a finished shot looking amazing for that compositor. The animator's, like, long gone on that shot. <laughs> yeah, this you see the mask right here. Basically, they're yeah. doing a, like a shadow pass where you can kind of see what's done by hand in that shot. Yeah, so you can see like that red line. Usually it's done with a different color too, so that you can, one, it's on a different layer, but also so you can see where those lines need to be. But also here you can see that light flooding in. They don't always do it like that. It might just be a line and then the team after knows this side is dark and this side is light. But like we've been talking about, sometimes it yeah. lands on the animator to do a little bit more. <laughs> You sure that recall button's right? This episode did a really good job at balancing its animation as well. Like some shots are done more in a TV style, keeping things solid or at the same angle to be more efficient, while other shots just go balls to the wall, just like insane 2D animation and craziness. So you got a whole team working on this, and you have these dudes. But they look like they're drawn by the same person. How do you achieve that? How do you keep it so it's like, these look like they're drawn by one person for the entire series? It's the job of the animation supervisor and animation director is to make it feel like it comes out of a single voice and a single hand. And that comes from a lot of character design, like early on, turning those characters around, knowing how they look, consistent tools, and then skill. Yeah. People being good at it. In 2D, you'll have the animation director will and should be doing, you know, drawovers to keep the character on model when Draw you can. Drawovers. So, like, so yeah. an artist draws a picture of the character yeah. for a frame. Yeah. And the director sips and is like, 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. I mean, depending what show, if it's a commercial, like, the director is probably also that could be the animation director, you know? But on a show like this, they're the funnel system. So any notes or thoughts and ideas that Jen has given or that, that you expect from Jen because you know what she likes, then you're kind of the funneling both down and up. So knowing, you know, the limits of that character, looking at the expression sheets can help you stay on model even better. But it does land on the character leads and stuff to set you up for success. It, it does get harder the bigger the team. When you compare even this to like a Robert Valley, this is a big team at a big studio. It's still confined compared to like a Pixar, but you got a lot of moving pieces. I'd definitely be curious to know the actual difference between the teams and like yeah. approach. I have no yeah. idea. Each project in Love, Death and Robots kind of left to its own to figure that out and yeah. do what's best for it. <laughs> Whoa, cell shading. This isn't a show, this is a game. <laughs> yeah, that's right. This episode is brought to you by Hunkai Impact. Let me tell you about some of the cool things that they've got ready for you this summer, including, first but not least, a new character. <laughs> Her name is Vil V, and she's got like eight different minds in one head. She's got a lot of cool helical contraptions and gears and stuff. I love mechanics, so does she. When in battle, she actually fights alongside her turrets and switches positions while firing. But oh man, once she gets on her chariot though, it's game over for nearby enemies because she'll be slashing them up like she's mowing the lawn. She's a very steampunk inspired character and seems like a lot of fun. Also, the game's got a bunch of summer events this year. And the first event is called the Summer Survival Rhapsody Side A. And during the event, captains can mix and match flame chasers and equip them with different weapons for battle. While rolling multiple dice during the battle to score points, you can then deal damage to enemies according to how many points you get. And if you play the event, you'll even get Miss Pink Elf's new outfit, the Summer Miss Elf. But don't forget about the second event they've got coming called the Summer Beach Melee. <laughs> Captains can actually bet on various flame chasers to win rewards. And finally, there's a login event. All you gotta do is just show up, log in, and you will get the Sakurai Summer, a new outfit for none other than Gushinso Memento. Additionally, there's some new outfits for Mobius and Pardo as well, inspired by the sea. There's even some visual effects being applied on the renders of their characters. And it is guaranteed in 10 drops. You won't be waiting around forever. <laughs> Once you download the game, use the gift code that we've put in our description to unlock all of the summer vibes. Anyway, enjoy the summer vibes, and thanks again to Honkai Impact for sponsoring this episode. Oh, I just heard the flush. I think they're coming back. I gotta get out of here. All right, I need your help. We have lots of great animations to react to, but I want to react to some anime from the 80s. You know, like, kind of the prime time for anime when, like, some really good stuff was coming out and no one knew about it. And, like, I don't really know much about anime from the 80s, so if there's, like, an amazingly animated anime from the 80s, please give us some suggestions down below. And, of course, you can suggest other stuff, too. We read all the comments. We take it all in. It's all good. Please leave a comment. All right, what an amazing episode. Thank you so much for joining us, Alex and Patrick. This time we're shouting out Patrick, because Alex has been on the show so many times that <laughs> yes. he's got plenty of shout outs. <laughs> <laughs> this is my shout out for Patrick. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, the Goon movie. Maybe keep an eye out for it in like a few years. In a while, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, you can follow Patrick on Twitter at uh, Patrick T. Osborne. And you know what? I asked these guys, was there anything they wanted to promote? And they said no. So I asked them to recommend you guys a movie. I would recommend Boy and the Beast. Uh, it's a little old at this point, but I just saw it for the first time. I thought it was a really great traditionally animated movie, worth checking out. I mean, this might be obvious right now, but everything everywhere all at once, everyone should see that. I thought it had to be animated. I was oh. tricked. <laughs> well, no, there's an animated rock. It blew my mind, it's such an amazing I want you to film. get everyone here for an Everywhere All at Once episode where it's stunt people, animation effects, everyone is here for Everyone, that movie. everywhere here all at once. <laughs> Sweet, well thank you so much for joining us guys. Thank you so much for watching. Consider subscribing, we'll see you either tomorrow on Sunday for our Sunday video or next Saturday for our next React video.